Quite different topic now. Uh, there's uh, a lot of interest at the moment in how you show that professionals working in a particular context are competent. Now, in, uh, in days gone by, uh, there were two main methods of doing this. One would be, have you done the training? And so long as you've got the degree, got the diploma, or attended the course and you have the certificate, there'd be an assumption that you're competent. The second way would be a kind of expert model. Have you done it for a certain number of time? Have you been apprenticed to someone? Uh, does someone think that you are now competent? But the third way, which is increasingly gaining traction, is a competency framework. And there's a, there's a burgeoning number of comp competency frameworks out there. Um, and uh, there's been some work uh, being undertaken uh, on behalf of CFCs on a competency framework by Chris Nicholson, who uh, we've got uh, here today, who's going to give us an update. Now, Chris is the training lead for the Consortium for Therapeutic Communities. Um, he's also the course director for a BA Honours course in therapeutic organisation and therapeutic communication. So he's very well qualified to lead on this work. So please welcome Chris. Hello, I've got to accommodate to being up here now because I, I rushed in late just to make Sarah anxious this morning. Uh, it's always the best way to arrive. Um, so she's stolen my advantage by having extra questions and things. So I've got to be careful about time because the one thing you don't want to do is miss your coffee. So I'm going to be very careful about that. The question that was coming up earlier, uh, in particular in relation to children's TCs and the uh, age and stage, we, we're all at an age and stage, aren't we? Uh, we'd all have to have that little preface with that we're in age and stage. There's, there's nobody here that uh, can do this sort of work in communities when they arrive, and you're developing all the time. So it would be a preface for us, for us all. And in a sense, that's part of what I'll be saying with the uh, competencies today. But, you know, we've got this launch, and so somebody has to say a few words. Uh, you shouldn't have chosen me because my words aren't very few. But I'm going to try to fit them in uh, to the time I've got. And I'm going to... Um, I obviously want to launch the, uh, the uh, core competencies, but I also want to do a couple of other things. One of them is to think a little bit about the problems for training, uh, partly in general, but also for, for therapeutic communities. Um, the second thing is to tell you about how we developed the uh, competencies. And the third thing is to make a bit of a case which is concerned with how to approach the core competencies um, this is a new resource. How should you approach it? Uh, what kind of attitude should you have? And just in case I don't make it to the end in time, I'm just going to tell you the case now. So it's up front. You heard it here uh, at the beginning. The case is, in brief, that the competencies that we're going to show you are a distillation of TC fundamentals. They should not be seen as an imposition into your community, some sort of outside imposition. Um, uh, sort of intrusion, but as a part of a self-regulating system of the TC. And this requires a very specific approach, and that involves curiosity, questioning, uh, and the questioning is really about oneself and one's relationship to others within the context of, of group living or, 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 or group sharing, group, group life. So to start with training, um, the... There are external factors and internal factors that are affecting the quality of people coming into TCs. And the two major external factors relate to the uh, regulatory framework that your communities fall within. Um, now, in social care, there's a huge issue with uh, recruitment. It's a long-standing issue. It's been around for a, a long time. Um, it originates probably with the low status of social care and health. Um, and despite this long history, there have been lots of initiatives to try to draw more people into the sector. Um, but yet, really, uh, vacancy rates in social care still hover around 4.5%. And that's about double uh, other sectors such as industrial, commercial and public sectors. Um, so that's a problem. Social care uh, inspection described the UK recruitment and retention issue as chronic, absolutely chronic. Um, now, there's been a, a big move over the last 10 years to draw many more 
uh, people into the sector and the care ambassador schemes, you have a sort of experienced professional who goes out and really tries to encourage people into the sector. And the, these are usually young people, maybe they're degree uh, students, uh, just post their degree, or they're often people that have had their children and want a change in life, want to do something important to them, they come into the sector. But really, the fact is, if you, if, you, if you want to work in health, education, or social care, you don't want to be a teacher, you don't want to be a social worker, you don't want to be a therapist, you don't want to be a nurse, there's really no pathway for you. There isn't a training program for uh, students of that kind. And even the one we run at Essex is really for people who are already in work. So the graduates that are going to actually be the people doing our job in, in you know, 30, 40 years' time, there's no pathway. And we're going to launch a, a degree uh, at Essex, at Centre for Psychic Studies, for that, and that will, that will come up in, in, in 2015. But unless you happen to have an organisation which is right next to a university and you've got good links, there's really no training for this sort of massive body of people that come into the sector. The second issue around regulatory framework is that um, it's obviously different for different TPCs depending on your sector. So um, I guess, you know, the one thing which is common is that regulation has increased massively over the last 10, 15, 20 years, <coughs> particularly in the UK. Um, and this has meant that the training programmes that are designed are really designed around the sort of edict of your regulatory body. And, and that's, um, that's a major difference, really, over the last sort of 20, 30 years. Um, we, we often had, in TCs, when we didn't have so much the charismatic... Uh, leaders of TCs, we ended up with charismatic training leads in TCs, and you've probably all got one, a terribly zippy, full of life, enthusiastic training lead, and they would often have created these rather marvellous trainings, and they emerged from the lifeblood of the organisation, they were related to the needs of the TC at the time, so they sprang organically out of the work you were doing and the concerns of the time. It might be some change in the client group that you're working with, something that you understand more deeply about the work and you want to get training on. Um, these kinds of trainings now are pushed into the margin, or even worse, you just have to buy them in. Uh, and the kind of training you want to do is, is uh, lost, and you end up really doing a lot of regulatory stuff that you're forced into. Um, and this is a big change. So, whereas years ago we used to think of ourselves being, uh, you know, struggling with our work because of our clients, these days we tend to see the difficulty of the work related to the organisational pressures uh, and the complexity of the organisations, the rate of change in organisations. Um, uh, Hughes and Pengali have recently equated Beyond's concept of nameless dread with a free-floating anxiety that seems to pervade organisations. Um, and for me, this is probably a, a, a consequence of managerialism, a government fixation, really, with uh, procedure, uh, structure, um, a, a, you know, a top-down kind of managerial system. And, um, you know, there's a sense in which every time a new set of regulation comes out attached to the latest bright idea, it means that you have to reorder your organisation to accommodate this. Um, and it's, you know, on, on the shop floor, in the community, in the life of the community, this is an enormous intrusion into the work that you're doing. And I think really what this is, is an example of a, a downward projection of anxiety um, from government. And it's one that I regret to say is often caught uh, by directors of services who over time come to believe in this sort of procedural panacea um, a structural way of working, and if we just get that structure right, that particular way of working right, then everything will be fine. And for me, of course, that just doesn't exist. You, you've got to find something else. It's not just going to be structure. It won't actually just be methodology. So you've got to find something else. Um, there's a, a book uh, about just entitled Working in Organisations, and not in any way about communities, and it's not psychoanalytic or anything of that kind. But they say that running an organisation is as much an emotive issue as it is an analytic issue. By that, they mean a, reason, a rational issue. And um, one of the things that they say is a real problem in an organisation is finding appropriate ways of integrating the person with the organisation. Um, and if you can't do that, they say, then the long-term uh, health of your organisation is very much in question. For me, this is where the core competence is going to fit in. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we develop them. So it was in 2013, the uh, uh, TCTC, in conjunction with the Community of Communities, 
set up a working group to think about competences. And, and we were aware of the sort of the way that competences were coming in, they're being used, and we were interested in how we could uh, use them within the, the work that we're doing. So we met in July, then we met again in October. We presented uh, to a small, discrete workshop at the Windsor Conference, and we got feedback um, from that, which was useful. Um, we, the group consisted of Mike Staines from the Mulberry Bush, uh, Carolina uh, Mac uh, Markanen from uh, Millfield, John Gale from uh, CHT, Andy Brooker from Henderson, Bill McGovern from the uh, University of Brighton, Sarah, you know Sarah from everywhere, and, uh, and myself from, from Essex University. Um, there are a couple of people from Brendan and, and Hollybrook House uh, who weren't able to come, but that they were included in our, in our thinking. So the representatives really um, were from adults and children's TCs. Um, we had Andy really speaking from the inside and the outside of, of the experience of a, a therapeutic community. We had uh, delegated attendants, attendees who were uh, really representing middle management and direct sort of casework, and all this was helpful. So we, we talked about the history of the competencies. We tried to define them. We had a lot of fun doing that. Um, and, uh, and we thought that our purpose was to, um, you know, gather up a definition for the competencies um, and then try to think about how we could use these in designing or recognising good quality training for TCs. Now, I don't necessarily mean that as training as separate from the experience of being in a TC, but it could be. It could be also. Um, <clears throat> Now, Sarah mentioned the standards and the sort of sense of a, a simplification of the standards has been going on for a few years, and this is to be welcomed because the standard becomes a kind of technology, a lumbering machine that's really difficult to manage, and it needs to be simplified. But obviously, if you simplify it, then you're going to lose some things, and you have to accept what you lose, so lose it at your peril. But I think it's no coincidence that the competency has come in at this moment, because if the, if the standards really are about the governance of the community... Uh, how the community functions, the framework for the community, then I think the competencies are going to relate to the individual and their contribution to the community. Okay, and that, that's a slightly different area I think they come in. Now, in terms of uh, defining um, competence, um, we're just looking at the dictionary definitions, and it starts in the 1590s with, uh, with rivalry, obviously related to competing. By 1600, it's talking about adequate supply, um, sufficiency of means for living at ease, you know, what you need to live at ease. Um, and then later, from the Latin, uh, competentia, com competentia uh, meaning meeting together, an agreement, symmetry, um, and its earlier sense of falling together, coming together, being convenient, fitting. Um, eventually, it's, it's defined as sufficiency to deal with what is at hand. Now, these definitions are quite interesting. They set up a, a, a range of tensions. So you, you've got something about competing in the marketplace, which is something you're all, you're all having to do, whether you want to be doing it or not. Um, that's very current. But you've also got this sense of competence, sort of bringing disparate parts together, um, the idea of falling together. And I think in a Bob Hinchelwood's term, you know, being creatures of, creatures of each other, um, without whom we're incomplete, I guess, and inadequate. So we need each other in this way. So we got to a definition of competency as uh, the behaviours, the technical attributes that individuals must have and must acquire to work effectively. So it was the personal attributes, the input of the individual that was important. And our very brief summary was competencies are the attributes we have to have to do the things we do, which is quite neat. <clears throat> Um, once we'd arrived at the definition, we broke into uh, some groups, and in the groups we looked at two questions. They're questions that we could all spend time thinking about. They're really good ones. Think about a person who inspired you. Uh, what qualities did they have? Think about the people you work with now who inspire you. Yeah? What qualities do they have? Think about that. This is your resource, these aspects. And, and when we got into this group, it was fascinating because inevitably we heard stories and anecdotes about people who had inspired us. And uh, ultimately, the competencies that you've got with you emerge from the feedback from this group. We've refined them and, and maybe expanded and sometimes contracted them. But they came out of that, that group, which was a sort of lively group. Rather than theory and stuff like that, we brought some life into it, you know? And that's where they seem to sort of live. 
Um, so there were difficulties, though, because the TCs have got so many different models. Um, so if you forget about, just for an instant, the social, ethical, sort of cultural distinctions which apply to all of us, some communities might have models which are sort of neurological, others might be psychological, some might be sociological, um, there might be psychodynamic aspects, Freudian, Kleinian, Lacanian features, eco-biological or people concerned with social learning theory. It's a real muddle. So how do you gather this together? Is there something that brings these things together? The standard sense suggests it might be psychodynamic. Some of you won't agree with that. I think you probably know where I stand. <laughs> but we didn't worry about that. What we did is we, we got on with debating it and we held on to the arguments. We held on to the disagreements. Um, there was something important in doing that. So even where we ended up with statements that seemed to be linked to theory, we didn't value them because of their link to a theory. We valued them because they seemed to have a capacity to communicate something of the intrinsic history and tradition of TCs. Okay, so, so when you read that, you, it should, you should feel at home with it. So in the end, we wanted the uh, competencies to come across as non-dogmatic, really, and, and they, I think they do do that. They fall short of being in any way systematic. Um, they, they hopefully, they give way to curiosity and flexibility. There are all kinds of applications for the competencies. Um, I think some of them you're going to discover for yourself, but obviously we've talked about training, uh, we've talked about de designing training. You might think of using them for learning outcomes for training. People often forget the learning outcomes, so that's one way of, of using them. They might be useful in updating uh, job profiles or thinking about recruitment. What is it you're looking for in staff? How do you want your staff to develop and, and how do you want that to happen? Another way of thinking about it is that uh, you know, using the networks of the CFC and TCTC and other networks possibly, um, we can describe the competencies as something that can bring cohesion uh, across sectors because it's non uh, disciplinary and it's, it's not a particular idea, a particular model. It maybe can bring some commonality across sectors and we desperately need that. So what I want to do now in the remaining what minutes? Ten, Ten minutes. Okay, it's all right. Is um, just so that you can see what they actually look like. You've got this preface here. Okay, so you've got the head page. You've got a preface. I'm going to draw on that in a second. Uh, a little model which I'll refer to, which you don't have, but you, you'll get that eventually. And then you have the actual framework. Now, you can't read it. I'm not going to read it to you, and it's too detailed. We might talk about it. So what I'm going to do now is just try to make a bit more clearly the case I made at the beginning about the particular attitude of mind that you might want to bring to the competencies, your relationship with the competencies, not just your manager's or your director's relationship. So this, this is coming pretty much from the preface. Our core competencies have been developed for therapeutic community organisations as a guide to the knowledge and skills which TC staff members can develop over time and with experience. A manualised approach to care and, or treatment is incompatible with our philosophy and therefore we adopt a developmental model of staff training. There can be no fixed blueprint for therapeutic community workers. Um, they can't adhere to this. Um, but within the particular context of their community, an attitude of mind can be nurtured. The core competences are designed as a resource and an aid memoir uh, in the process of this development of staff. We believe that community itself has the potential to function therapeutically because the experience of belonging to a community and being valued by others no matter how damaged the person may be, is in itself reparative. In therapeutic community, rather than focusing on the fulfilment of the individual, the emphasis is on participation of all community members, staff as well as clients. This includes participating in everyday running of the community and in discussing, reflecting on, and taking into account the unspoken, hidden, or unconscious aspects of group living and group processes. Each member's difficulties, that's everyone in the community, each member's difficulties are seen as being open to improvement by drawing upon the total resources of the community from all of its members 
and the, and the planned environment. Working with clients in this way requires TC practitioners to uh, uh, acknowledge and pursue their, their own development. It includes becoming aware of a specific range of therapeutic community approaches, developing within the, the tradition of TCs, and align to this an increasingly sophisticated awareness and use of self in relation to others. The acquisition of these competencies is seen as a gradual process and can continually be enhanced and, and uh, developed at deeper levels. Apart from then the resource in terms of training and uh, you know, um, uh, development in other ways, recruitment, that sort of thing, it can also help establish a mechanism for the transmission of the community culture uh, over time. Now, Andrew Colley um, described the need to actively transmit the culture of a therapeutic community, and it was Tom Main who originally, in the 1990s, um, you know, uh, drew us to this particular issue, the business of transmission. It is true to say that um, you know, we know in a community that we, we want to have a, uh, a solid, sort of very clear structure. We know what we want to do. We want people to know what their job is. We, we want to know that. And when we start, we do. But over time, things shift we begin to lose our way. Staff don't do what they're supposed to do. They're doing something else. They've found another task they may, may or may not be aware of. Uh, the sense of the primary task of the organisation drifts. You've lost it. And you'll begin to think, well, well, well how did this happen? And a sort of general anxiety pervades. Um, and so no matter how rational your system is and how good your model is, you're prone to these processes. So what's required is some self-regulatory function and, you know, talking together in community meetings and these kinds of things are a part of that. But it's got to go beyond that. It's got to go deeper into an individual. It's got to go deeper into the way that we relate to each other. <clears throat> so the Andrew Colley uh, model um, talks about how there's an evolving competence over time uh, of the worker's awareness and openness to learning. Practitioners move from a very novice-like, limited awareness of their of their understanding, which gets called uh, unconscious incompetence. I remember being so bad at my job, I didn't know how bad I was at my job. I was that bad. It took a long time to recognise that I had flaws and faults. You know, the novice always exaggerates, don't they? They're full of enthusiasm and they, they know what they're doing. It, take, it took a long time to knock that out of me. So in, in unconscious incompetence. But on a developmental trajectory toward a sort of uh, conscious awareness of how bad I was, See, so gradually I began to realise a very painful process, I guess I'm still in it, of aware, awareness of how bad I was. And then, and then over time, maybe through intuitive guesses, lucky successes, something about interjecting something of the ethos of the community, the individuals around you and the way they're thinking and the way they're working, um, one begins to sort of feel conscious, uh, sorry, unconscious, but, but gets better at one's job. It doesn't know why one's doing it actually managing to do your job much better, understand the clients a little better, understand the colleagues and the processes. Couldn't put it into words. Um, and then gradually, over time, one might get to a conscious competence, an awareness of where we are. Now, this is a process that you can go through again and again and again each time you start thinking about a different area of your work or a different aspect of learning or a different aspect of your own self-development. Yeah? Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but we've reversed a couple of bits of Collie's model because we think it fits better. We think you end up with conscious awareness, um, but you've got to go through an unconscious process before you get there. So you can look into that and think about that for yourselves. Um, so I guess to conclude, pretty much, um, the competencies are a guide and aid memoir for TC practitioners. Through them, they can develop a deeper, more conscious level of awareness um, but at the same time, participating in a total transmission of the culture of the organisation. Yeah? So you're doing something for your own development, but at the same time, you're stabilising the culture of the organisation and providing for its transmission. Through this transmission, uh, the specific theoretical framework and practices in involved in your community, you're also contributing to the self-regulation of the community. And I guess it's because of this particularly deep personal involvement that one wants to come to the competencies when you look at them, not just as a list, but as a series of ideas, a series of thoughts, a series of experiences that people have had before you sort of come to them. 
and have a relationship with them, which is going to require you to not understand some of them and to go through a process of feeling awkward and annoyed that somebody else might understand something that you don't. And over time, come to terms with them. And that that's okay for that to be the process. Um, it doesn't really compare with the bullet points of some of the competencies. And I've been looking at different competencies. I've been looking, I'm, I'm com incompetent. I've been looking at so many competencies recently. And they're fairly you know, focused on bullet points. They're very easily understandable. But these ones are not going to be. You're going to have to wrestle with them a bit. Okay, so that's pretty much my presentation. And I'm going to stop there, and we might have a bit of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So, so we do have a couple of minutes. I'd like to kick off, if I may, Chris. Uh, what happens next with these? Huh, what happens next? Yeah, I'd love to just say, over to you. Because that's the way it always happens, isn't it, in the community meeting? And what, what do you want to do with this? Um, well, the, you know, you've got the competencies, so they're in your, you're in your pack, and, and at some point we'll link the preface to them, and that will go out, I guess, to, to uh, members uh, of the consortium and members of the community of communities. And so you, you've got an opportunity to think about how you want to use them. I've made some recommendations for how you can use them. Um, the, the obvious ones are to just sort of think about whether they're reflecting your organisation. People have tested them out and they seem to say they do, um, but, you know, somebody's going to come up and say they don't and there's a problem with they need something added. I mean, I, I guess that's going to happen. But, um, you know, so you can begin thinking about how they fit in with the culture of your organisation, what kind of training you have available. Could, could you find a way of using these in your training? You know, do, is that something that's going to be helpful? Maybe it will help you to, to work out precisely what you need, actually, in the organisation. It's very difficult sometimes to ascertain quite what's required. And maybe reading through these will help prompt you. Think about gathering some of these ideas together. Um, so, yeah, you, know, you can certainly use them in terms of uh, recruitment, retention of staff. You can use them in terms of, I think, most importantly, staff development. If you've understood the community of community standards, you recognise that there's something you should be doing all the time. If you do them right, you are a therapeutic community because you're having to communicate and talk to each other and interact and come up with new ideas and solve problems. Okay? So what I would be saying about the competencies is in a similar way, there for the individual to get in touch with their contribution to that process from the inside of the community, the role that you have to play in making the community work. That, for me, that's the most important thing. I imagine there are a number of other functions they, they could have. Okay, just, we're just going to have one question then. Yes, Kevin. Wonderful. Thank you much, Kevin. So, well... Uh, and the CFC training will be too. So, in a sense, you've got these two elements of training that are going to be utilising these. I'm sure some painstaking person will link them to the standards, but it, it ain't going to be me. OK. We're going we're gonna to take a ten-minute break, but I'm, I must uh, just say that we're, there's no coffee in this break. This is just a comfort break. So, we're, please no, come there's back. There's no comfort in that. <laughs> so please come back at half past sharp and, and we'll start again. So thank you again to Chris.